Um, and the moderator today is my colleague in the School of Journalism, Emily Metzger, who is finishing her third year with the school. And um, Emily has an interesting background um, with regard to international studies and international uh, affairs. Um, she um, got her PhD uh, in uh, media and public affairs at Louisiana State University a few years ago. And uh, she's a former U.S. diplomat and uh, additional, has additional professional experience at the National Defense University and the United States Institute of Peace. She served as a community columnist for the Shreveport, Louisiana Times for about four years, and her work has also appeared in the Christian Science Monitor, the Los Angeles Times, and the International Herald Tribune. Um, she's been a State Department for Foreign Service Officer, and uh, for six months she had intensive uh, training in Mandarin language before then serving in the American Embassy in Beijing as a counselor and a political officer in 1998-1999. Uh, she has a research focus on Chinese media and American perceptions of China and portrayals of the bilateral relationship. And she'll introduce the panel, so it's our pleasure to welcome and to introduce uh, Emily Metzger, who's our moderator for today. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our panel here. I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about each person here, tell you what they, um, what we're going to be talking about, and then I'm just going to open it for a free-for-all. Um, the first is um, Professor Scott Kennedy, who is the um, leader of the delegation of the group of us that went to China that you'll be hearing about. He is the director of the Research Center for Chinese Politics and Business here at IU. His research focuses on business lobbying, economic policy making, global governance, and of course U.S.-China relations. He is. Um, quite a well-regarded China hand, and it's, it's pretty amazing to have a resource like this here in the community. Um, next, we'll turn to Christine Davis, who is the Associate Director for the Center for International Business Education and Research at the Institute for International Business at the Kelly School. She coordinates um, numerous outreach workso workshops, does international program planning, um, coordinates language tutoring, and organizes conferences and special events. Um, then we turn to George Flahakis, who um, is from the IU Office of Public Affairs. He's um, the manager. Of, he is a manager of media relations. He coordinates media relations and international cooperation, and he served as our trip historian, photographer, and documentarian. So he has um, much to share with us. And then um, we have two journalists joining us today: Greg Andrews, who's managing editor of the Indianapolis Business Journal, um, who's actually descended from America China Hand royalty. I will let him um, fill you in on that. He um, is a graduate of IU's Department of Telecom, but we welcome him here, regardless. <laughs> um, he's been writing the Behind the News column for IBJ since 2000, and um, can now add having been blacked by Chinese censors to the, his list of professional accomplishments. <laughs> and finally, we'll turn to Chris File, who's a reporter at the Bloomington Herald Times, has been since fall 2009. His focus is on Indiana state politics and business. He's a graduate of Syracuse um, University. And like other um, royalty in the news, he's getting married next month. <laughs> okay, so um, in terms of order of events, I'm going to turn to Scott and ask you to um, take the lead to discuss the origins of this trip and the connection to um, ongoing work at the Research Center. Sure. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Emily, and thank you all for, for coming today. It's a real honor to be able to, uh, to join this group and, and, and uh, introduce uh, our research center and also uh, the trip and the, and the role that we played in uh, fostering uh, journalism's efforts to, to increase, in, improve its coverage of China. Uh, the Research Center for Chinese Politics and Business is about four years old. It's composed of faculty across IU, both on the Bloomington and Indianapolis campuses. And uh, our main purpose is to, to promote research and understanding at the intersection of Chinese politics and the global world of business. Uh, for uh, uh, several years, we've had a, an initiative on US-China business cooperation. And, we've co and with regard to that, in 2009, we hosted a large delegation from Zhejiang province in China here in Indianapolis and in Bloomington uh, for a, a three-day conference. Uh, Zhejiang province is located just southeast of Shanghai along China's coast and, and so it made natural sense since both Zhejiang and Indiana are coastal, it's coastal states to be sister provinces and states. Um, but actually we, we've had this cooperative effort for, for 30 years uh, and we had a terrific uh, event in 2009 
uh, one aspect of that event focused on promoting uh, the uh, legal awareness amongst entrepreneurs. And so in that event in 2009, we cooperated with uh, the uh, IU's Entrepreneurship Law Clinic, which, which is both in the Kelly School and the Morris School of Law. And we helped uh, the Zhejiang University's Law School develop a similar type of program so that small scale entrepreneurs, uh, when faced with legal circumstances, don't look at a bribe as the first solution, but actually hiring a lawyer uh, and, and solving things. Um, That's sort of bribe. Yeah. So, and in any case, in 2011, we had that return visit to China planned. Uh, going back to Zhejiang. And on this occasion, instead of focusing on law, since we solved the rule of law problem in China and everything now follows contracts, um, we thought it would be really good to focus uh, on, on media and, and journalism in addition to the general research uh, that, that we uh, do. Uh, and so together with uh, cyber, and you'll be hearing from, from Christine in a minute about cyber and their role in, in increasing knowledge about China, uh, we developed a program in which we wanted to have, give an opportunity for Midwest journalists uh, to better understand China and figure out how to cover it in a way that was important and understandable to their readerships or viewerships uh, or listenerships. Uh, and so uh, over the past year or so, we started inviting uh, journalists, foreign correspondents who had been in China to come to uh, Indiana and uh, give speeches, give talks, uh, meet with local media. Uh, in, in late February 2010, we had Peter Goodman from the New York Times, who had been a, a correspondent in Shanghai for a while, uh, come and talk. And he went to, I want to make sure I get this correct, Louisville. Uh, he gave a talk. In addition to here, he went to Louisville. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and then in February of, of this year, we had John Pomfret, who had been a longtime correspondent for the Washington Post in China is now head of their, uh, is their Asian diplomatic correspondent in Washington, but he travels a lot. Um, and then uh, in the process as well of getting ready for trip, we then approached journalists to see who might be interested. And luckily we found three really excited, enthusiastic <laughs> people, uh, George Vlahakis, Chris Vile, and Greg Andrews. Um, and uh, we did had a, some activities again before the trip, uh, helped uh, give them a chance to do some reporting while they were in China. Uh, and then afterwards, we've been trying to you know, make sense of everything. And so uh, our goal is, 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 is that we understand that for uh, the journalism profession, um, budgets are relatively tight, uh, but the world is becoming ex extremely small and t tightly close woven together. And so the world is more important than ever for us to understand, but our ability to cover it is, is, is more and more difficult. Uh, and so uh, even newspapers that used to have for foreign correspondents in China have less now. Uh, some don't have any anymore. Um, and so uh, regional media oftentimes has to depend on wire services. And I think even the wire service coverage isn't as good as it, as it needs to be. Uh, and, and so that was sort of the, the motivation for us behind uh, this uh, project. Um, the visit just, I, I thought, went terrific. They're going to tell you uh, about their findings, and you can read about them online just to click away. Um, I'll just mention um, that uh, one of the members of our center's advisory board, his name is Tom Gorman. He's the uh, publisher of Fortune China, the Chinese language edition of, of Fortune magazine. And he just sent me a blog entry that he posted over the weekend of, a, of his very first trip to China in 1975. Um, and some of the things that stood out for him from his 1975 trip. Uh, no business cards. No exchanging of <laughs> business cards. You, people didn't want to know, want you to know who they worked for or what their rank was. Uh, people were standoffish. They didn't want to talk to you. Uh, they were really concerned about the political repercussions. Uh, every meeting that he was in in 1975 began with a political rant against the United States, a diatribe. <laughs> Uh, of just pounding away until they had done their duty and then their conversation could occur. And then lastly, uh, very little economic development when he was there. Uh, he went all through Guangdong province. Uh, not a whole lot to speak of. I think on each of these areas, uh, you'll hear uh, that things look a little bit different in the China of 2011 than they do of China of 1975. So uh, with that, I'll just say, again, it was a real pleasure for our center to have a role in this, uh, to be able to cooperate with cyber. Uh, and 
uh, with uh, the School of Journalism. And so uh, thank you all for coming today. Thanks, Scott. Christine, can you talk a little bit about the role of cyber? In sure. So um, cyber stands for the Center for International Business Education and Research, so that's why we call it cyber. Um, and we are a Department of Education grant, and so we are funded primarily through um, the Department of Education, at least through October 1st, and we'll find out what happens after that. But um, our primary mission is to actually um, help internationalize American business, and so and to help really um, help the competitiveness of American business. And so we partner with a lot of different um, departments on campus, such as Scott's Research Center, as well as a number of the other national resource um, centers to help with various activities. So this conference was one of those. Um, as you see, we're taping the session today, and we will be posting that on, or this on our website um, to serve as a resource for anyone interested in China um, throughout the U.S. and even the world, um, because we also serve as a national resource center. Um, and so China is obviously one of our um, focal areas, as well as um, North, uh, North Africa, the Middle East, and then Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, China right now is a little bit easier to go to than North Africa and the Middle East, so. Um, but we're working on sending people to the other locations. So that's us in a nutshell. Okay, thanks. George, um, do you want to talk a little bit about your role representing IU to Certainly. China? Certainly. Just, just thought I'd mention that we, the, we thought we might be able to show the pictures a little larger, but it's, uh, so if anyone wants to look at pictures afterwards, I've got my laptop here. Um, just following up on what Scott had to say, I, I really panicked about 10 minutes ago because I realized I hadn't brought my business cards. <laughs> <laughs> and there, um, you absolutely have to have your business cards. Um, as, as Scott mentioned, the IU Office of University Communications worked closely with the center uh, we worked with them with regard to the visits of our uh, of the, of the journalists who covered China. And, uh, uh, and, and then we talked, I remember, last year about the opportunity of taking journalists with us. And so over the past eight months, Scott worked on finding funding, working with Christine, and, and I provided input. And, and thankfully, we were able to attract Chris and, uh, and Greg. And they were able to get support from their editors, which I think is an accomplishment in itself because this meant them leaving their, their beats for a week to go to China. Um, so I think the commitment that they received was, was commendable as well. And, and to prepare them and, and myself, the Research Center brought in uh, Mr. Pomfret, but also we had orientation sessions to learn about Shanghai and China and the culture. And so this really prepared us well for an experience really for us to help explain to people back here and elsewhere uh, a little bit more about what China is like in 2010 as opposed to many years ago. And um, so um, also uh, with support from the Office of University Communications and Creative Services, we developed a new blog that would allow me to chronicle the trip for everyone back here uh, and ultimately worldwide. And I have previously served as the official photographer and as a blogger for similar trips involving students in, in India, Korea, and uh, uh, so now China. We developed the China blog using WordPress, which if any of you are getting into blogging is a really great tool, uh, but also we hosted it on an IU server so that anyone, including uh, people in China, could see the blog. Because as you may be aware, access to YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Blogger, WordPress, these are all restricted in China, and especially now since we've had the Jasmine Revolution taking place around the world. And nearly every day during the trip, I would go back to our hotel room, and we had a very, very full schedule each day, starting out about 7.30 in the morning, and we often wouldn't wrap up until about 7 o'clock at night. So I would go back and I wrote articles and I wrote 23 articles of offering impressions about the places we visited, the people we met, the food we ate, other people's impressions. Uh, thanks to having this laptop, I wrote about my experience on the world's fastest train while on the train. <laughs> so you can read about that too. 
It was going 200 miles an hour between Hangzhou and Shanghai. Uh, we also visited two auto plants, including a Chinese plant, uh, a company, um, as well as General Motors, and I still would buy a Chevy. Um, we also were introduced to successful IU alumni, not only Chinese students who have come here to study and then graduated, but also Hoosiers who are now working in China. And so this blog, IU Takes You to China, has had 11,500 visitors since it was launched on March the 10th. And much like uh, my blogs about India, where there was a lot of interest in China. And so at one point, nearly 10% of all the traffic to the blog was coming from China. Other visitors have come from, the, you know, top visitors besides the United States, of course, and now at this point about 90% of the visitors are from the United States, uh, have included the Russian Federation, several nations in Europe, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Thankfully, it hasn't been blocked yet. Um, and so, in addition to bringing people along on our trip, hopefully we foster some new understanding of a people and a place. We didn't focus on politics, at least on the blog. And uh, we've also demonstrated how Indiana University continues to be a welcoming place for students from all over the world. And the fact that today's presentation is going to be recorded for further viewing kind of emphasizes that. And so I welcome all of you to look at my pictures, uh, visit my blog, and uh, learn more about uh, all the experiences that we had. But really, I'll leave it to the professional journalists to really have yeah. that. Yes. Please. Um, Greg and Chris, tell us about your impressions, traveling, working, doing your job there, what it's been like since getting back. You want to start? You want to start? Um, okay, sure. Um, well, you know, I think that one of the things that, uh, that, that Scott mentioned early and was really important, and, and George mentioned it a little bit, is I work at the Herald Times in Bloomington, and uh, probably many of us in the room are familiar with the Herald Times. Uh, we're a little bit provincial, right? We don't, we don't care a whole ton about what happens in Fort Wayne. Forget about Shanghai. <laughs> And, and so I, I was really interested in trying to bring that home not only for, for the editors, and, but I mean not only for the readers, but also for the editors. I mean, how, how does China really affect our lives in South Central Indiana? Um, and I thought that the trip was wonderful because we care so much here about life sciences. You know, we, we are really trying to aim and, and position ourselves in, in a global marketplace. And, and we are competing not against just Indianapolis and all the research that happens there and in Lafayette uh, and places like that, but we're also very evidently competing against places in, in China. And that was, I think, came clear to me in a way that it had never come clear to me before on, on the trip. You know, we, one of the places that we did go to was a, and I wrote a story about it for the HT, was a, 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 a laboratory called Crown Biosciences outside of <clears throat> uh, Shanghai. And there they had the wet lab space that looks almost identical to wet lab space that I've been at the Innovate Indiana Center over there on East 10th. I um, mean, it just looked straight up like a, a lab in the US. And they had scientists there working as we walked through. And the costs for running the lab per scientists were one third of the costs for running a lab here. And um, that was a really a, a breakthrough moment for me and my understanding of China. And I tried, you know, tried to bring home that for my readers. And, and, and Greg did, I think, the same thing. I mean, he, he ran a wonderful stories. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I said yesterday to Greg that I was jealous of him. The, the Herald Times is a paywall. So not, you know, that's frustrating for reporters because our, our content can't get out quite as wide as we'd like it to get out. Um, but, but Greg's website was blocked by the Chinese government which I was jealous of, because <laughs> that meant his, his reporting had been all that much more subversive than mine. And he tried to make me feel good by saying, well, well yours is kind of blocked anyway because of the paywall. But, but we know people love to pay for news, so I don't really, ca I can't imagine that the paywall is what's the problem there. So anyway, that was one of my major impressions. Um, I'll pass it on to you, and you can take it from there. My experiences were similar. Um, when I first uh, just found out about this great opportunity to go on the trip, I thought uh, the challenge for us is to make this an Indiana story because we're very local, we're very focused on the businesses in central Indiana. Uh, the good news is uh, that was not at all challenging to find an Indiana story because uh, a lot of our biggest companies, uh, Eli Lilly is by far our largest company, uh, 
it has 3,000 people in China already. It's the biggest uh, concentration of employees outside the United States uh, for that company. So it's, and that's just one of many examples. Uh, a lot of our companies in s central Indiana are really struggling to grow um, for various reasons, but one of them is the U.S. economy is just not growing very quickly. So if they want to grow at 5 or 10 percent a year or more, it's very difficult to do that in an economy that might grow 2 percent to 3 percent. So uh, another one of our companies, WellPoint, uh, big health insurer, is, uh, has a tremendous market share in this country and is very successful, but the challenge when you have a big market share is it's hard to get to move the needle at that point because you're already so big. And then uh, uh, I think I was aware of the basic numbers in China where it's four times the population in the United States. Um, and of course that's very appealing in the fact that there are so many people moving into the middle class and wanting to con purchase cars and other goods that used to be out of their reach. But uh, that was probably somewhat of a superficial not understanding and uh, by having the chance to go I gain a much more nuanced appreciation for what's really happening, the good things and the challenges. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful trip. Um, you know, you know, and one thing I did want to say that I forgot to make a note of was that Scott said that back in the '75 uh, that all the meetings began with a criticism of the U.S. government. Um, one of the things that was striking for me and it was really unexpected for me uh, was how many times we heard Chinese people criticize the Chinese government. I mean, I kind of have, sitting here in central Indiana, a, a, a rather limited understanding of, of that debate that's happening in China, but it was interesting. And, uh, you know, I would encourage everybody to, to, you know, connect with Christine and with Scott if you have any interest in that. Be, just kind of understanding China in a more complex way and, and being there was really interesting to, to hear ra rather pointed and sharp criticisms of Chinese government by Chinese entrepreneurs who presumably had quite a lot to lose. So that, mm -hmm. that was pretty interesting. So anyway, that's, that's it for me. Thank you so much for having us here. That seemed, uh, to me, that was one of the big takeaways was, and I haven't totally gotten my arms around it, but you did have very sharp criticism that sounded almost exactly the same as you might hear US business executives complaining about how the government is making it more difficult for them to be successful. Uh, and then at the same time, you had website. So you come away from that thinking, boy, this is much more open than I thought. But then you come away from that and the New York Times website is blocked. Uh, uh, Facebook is blocked. Uh, oddly, IBJ.com became blocked. Um, and you're, uh, it, it seems almost uh, full of contradiction and maybe, maybe it is. Uh, um, the, uh, one of the issues that came up while we were there was uh, there was a run on salt purchasing in China because uh, uh, Chinese people were uh, concerned about uh, what was happening with uh, radiation from Japan and the, uh, the uh, Chinese state media was saying there was no reason to be concerned but because the public didn't quite trust the, what the government is saying that caused them to be concerned so it's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's a mixed up world. I, I think an, another thing I'd, I'd like to just add is that um, we, we're hearing an awful lot in our community about education and about language education. And from the moment we got off the plane, all the signs were in English and Chinese. And you, you found it on road signs, it was consistent throughout. And we, now I'm not saying we spent a lot of time among a lot of the ordinary, um, you know, everyday citizens, but I, I had no problems with language in China. Uh, we had a translator with us who helped us a lot in a lot of contexts. We had some great translators. But I was so impressed by their, their knowledge, uh, their proficiency in English. And so it makes you think about our, our education system and how much more we should emphasize other business languages being taught. <clears throat> Um, maybe I should just clarify just for uh, the audience the, the, what the week looked like. So we arrived in China on a Sunday or on a Saturday. Uh, we went uh, from Shanghai by bus two hours to Hangzhou, which is the capital of Zhejiang province. Uh, we then had two days uh, conference in 
uh, Hangzhou with Zhejiang University. Uh, and then we spent the next uh, three and a half days visiting companies, uh, both Chinese companies and foreign companies, American companies. Uh, we went to a media group and saw all their high-tech stuff related to HD TV and di digital TV that they had. Uh, we, we met with a senior uh, party official from Zhejiang province who's also the party secretary of, Zheji of Zhejiang University. Uh, and then we, can, we had a dinner with uh, uh, some foreign correspondents uh, who were in, based in Shanghai. And then we had a reception uh, with uh, IU alumni. Uh, we had about 90 folks there at the reception, uh, which I'm told is more than the governor or could get to come to his reception with IU alumni last November. So I felt very proud of that. Um, uh, and, and, then, uh, and then we all came home. So that's what the week looked like. We would love to entertain questions from all of you. It's a room full of journalists. Surely there are some questions. <laughs> Sure. Uh, I'm interested in the balance that you both face as a group between um, diplomacy, journalism, and responsibility to the people you connected with. Mm -hmm. So this is being uh, this will be available on the website. We talked about having things on the IU website, therefore I gathered yeah. from that comment it would not be blocked. Um, and yet you're being very open about people there being quite critical of their, uh, of their own government or their own leaders. So I'm interested in how you work through that and what you think the issues are that, that as you work and connect with a society that has such a different experience and background, how do you negotiate that issue of diplomacy, responsibility, journalism, transparency, all those things? I think that's a great question. I mean, one of the things uh, that, uh, thankfully, Scott and George, we, it was a frenetic trip. You know, we were, we were beginning at, at like very early in the morning, we were going till way late at night, and we were cl closely managed. Mm. Um, so, you know, we heard, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in particular one seminar, it was about entrepreneurship in China, and it was in Hongzhou, which is like a city many of us have probably never heard of, but it has like six million people. It's a gigantic city. Um, and, and, and that was really difficult when, to hear you know, th those criticisms because there wasn't a good sense. It was hard to get any kind of real, um, real grip on what they were saying. You know, I mean, we're not China. I'm not a China expert. I certainly don't know a lot. You know, we were traveling with them. Um, but that was something that I felt uh, was okay to talk about and to write about in a little bit, but I didn't have like a gigantic story. I mean, because I, my reader interest is mostly about central Indiana. Didn't have a gigantic story about, well, you know, Chinese people are critical of their own government. You know, that, that it was harder for me really to figure out how to write about it from a reader interest perspective and an editor interest perspective than it was from a, well, there is internal strife. So I did not feel compelled to be di diplomatic in my coverage. I, I went over and talked to the, 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 a couple of people who were quite critical after the conference, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah. One of the guys is a member of the party. I mean, you know, he, he owned a company. He was a member of the party. He said, yeah, we are a middle income trap. We're, we're, we're taxing our companies to death. You know, we're just, you know, it just sounded like an American businessman. Um, so I don't know. I, yeah. I felt free to write whatever, really, I was. But the biggest issue was many notebooks full of information that I had to boil down into a, a set of stories rather quickly. So uh, some of these things we may, I may still address in the future, but uh, I think we, felt we were challenged by not always feeling as though we uh, knew if someone made a comment, we didn't necessarily know the bigger context that well. I found right. myself turning to people who knew much more about China to uh, put things in perspective uh, because after a week, you know, I'm just getting started and learning about China, really. Yeah. As far as blogging for IU, um, I, I really didn't self-censor, but I also didn't consider myself the China expert either. Um, but, you know, we did, for example, we met with uh, a news director at the TV station, and uh, he was quite open about being a member of the party, how many, the percentage of his staff, 30%, were party members. And he told us, well, they're, they're the party in power, and we report the news. 
uh, from from you know because that they're the government, and and I I put that in the blog. I didn't you know, but I also didn't see the blog as a place to to criticize either. I just reported what I heard, and also in a blog format, you're doing much shorter articles. You're not writing the long investigative pieces, but uh, uh, I think what you'll find is is pretty much uh, our perspectives, at least, uh, and I reported what other people had to say um, from our group in the blog. So um, in terms of, I don't, I think there was mainly a, just an effort to inform from our perspective. What did you hear from the foreign correspondents that you met with? Um, go ahead. I sat next to a Wall Street Journal correspondent for dinner one evening, which was very interesting. And he was, he was talking about the fact that a lot of the state-owned media did cover the bad news. It wasn't that they wouldn't cover negative stories, but what they didn't necessarily do is connect the dots, uh, draw out the larger meaning of what they were writing about. Uh, and that was how he spends his time. And, his, and he, uh, uh, he, there have been some efforts to as you all are probably aware, uh, restrict the foreign press. I think right before uh, we went, uh, the government, the police said that they, uh, foreign, foreign reporters could not go to certain locations in uh, Beijing and Shanghai where there were efforts to organize uh, protests. And uh, uh, so they, they have some issues to deal with that we certainly don't in this country, but I think, uh, for a reporter there, the opportunities are just wonderful because there's uh, fascinating stories to be told that are uh, uh, very new to the rest of the world. I think he sounded like he was having a great time. Greg, was there any uh, Chinese equivalent in Europe? Europe they, did either of you talk with any Chinese journalists or was there any interplay there at all? Um, we, uh, the only example, I guess, would be when we went to the TV station and talked to the news director. Well, and one of our, tra our translator, who, uh, his name is Jetty, and he was a 24-year-old graduate student who was very fluent in English. Um, he worked for the state news agency, the Sichuan News Agency, as a reporter from time to time. Um, and so I talked to him about his experiences just as, you know, kind of, he compared it to the Associated Press, which I think would... Feel, AP people would feel hardly done by because it's a state news agency. But uh, he talked a lot about how he he gets uh, you know, his compensation is primarily through kickbacks. You know, he goes and covers. You know, he writes up press releases and he, he shows his face and he can get up to you know a uh, hundred dollars U.S., which is, is quite a bit of money for you know if he writes a good story about a company's tea product. So you know, I mean, we we did have some sense of that interplay from you know even very <laughs> formal news sources and very local. Uh, companies and, and you know if, if we write good we'll, we'll reward you and and so he was uh, highly motivated by that and I asked him you know he was a very open fellow I think we all really enjoyed mm -hmm. speaking with him you know if you felt bad about that you know do like you know like I would feel terrible as an American reporter taking oh he says oh no I'm out for the money you know that's why I'm in it and uh, you know he got it he's getting out of the news business because being in news requires doing a lot of drinking and smoking with the government officials like that's how you progress and he says my liver can't take it so he's getting out. That's uh, he's, he was an interesting. Person. And, and just to go along with that, um, when uh, we met with the Wall Street Journal reporter, he talked about the process of arriving at meetings, uh, and you would have to sign in, to check in, and there were two lines, one for the foreign press and one for the, uh, the you know the, the Chinese media, and they would get an envelope, uh, and so they that's where they the were Chinese would yeah yeah, and so. Uh, it was pretty interesting. I'll just add, in terms of uh, the coverage and evolution of the Chinese media, I think we, we've heard already there's sort of three kinds of reporting or writing that the Chinese media does. Uh, they do PR for companies or for others that need it, uh, and they get compensated for it. Uh, they do government PR, so they do things that are politically, write stuff that's politically correct. Uh, but then they also do real news stories. You will find in real investigative news stories uh, by enterprising journalists and editors who are willing to take a chance. Uh, typically this is uh, local media who report on the bad behavior of 
officials in other localities uh, because that's safer. Uh, but, it, but there is that type of muckraking that, that goes on. Uh, the central government thinks that that's good type of news coverage because it helps them, it's another way for them to ferret out uh, local officials that aren't following central government policies or that lead or that do things that generate local protests and get uh, lead to social dissatisfaction, which is bad for, for Beijing. So that, that type of hard news coverage is actually beneficial to the regime to stay in power because it ferrets out the bad apples at the local level. Uh, of course, every time it, it, it does bump up against the ceiling and the ceiling's height raises or lowers depending on what's going on elsewhere in the world or which official it's, it's, it might eventually connect. But there are all these three things sort of swimming around with each other at the same time, which makes it hard to kind of pin, you know, which type of story are you writing today? So that kind of thing, so. Uh, last question, any? Uh, I, I would just ask, okay, one in the back. Yeah. Okay, Michael. Uh, if I understand things correctly, China is or is about to be the largest economy in the world. And if I also understand things correctly, by 2030, I think India is going to be the most populous nation in the world, passing China. Given that, did you get much sense either from the media or from the business people, and any sense of hustle? Are they working really hard to become the largest economy in the world, and do they see India over their shoulders gaining on them? Um, well, I was interested in your your study of American perceptions of China. Um, where, 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 tell us a little bit about like what we see, and then we can address that. Yeah. Um, my colleague Lars Wilnot and I, both from the School of Journalism, um, presented research while we were there. We had done, um, it's a two-part study. The first part is, um, an, uh, was an online opinion survey of Americans' views of China and the Chinese. And we asked specifically questions about um, what perceptions were of the size of the Chinese economy. Interestingly, um, a large number of respondents believed that China already was the world's largest economy, when in fact it would be something that happens within the next 10 years or so. Um, we are also looking at the way the New York Times has covered China over um, the period of 2010, breaking the stories down into different kinds of categories. Of course, business and finance is big, internal security issues are big, um, international security, bilateral issues are, um, are big. But we, we had a chance to sort of delve into a little bit of that from the American side. Um, I think one of the benefits of what we had done with connecting with people at Zhejiang University is um, we've identified a scholar at Zhejiang University who might be interested in working with us doing a counterpart study um, matching up the same sort of public opinion and media coverage analysis of China, or from China, about the United States, which could be very interesting. In direct response to your question, I don't think we saw, I, I didn't hear anyone say, oh, I'm worried about India. I didn't hear that. I did ask oh. Jetty. I, I, we had a, a long three-hour bus ride when we were going to the Geely motor, uh, Automobile Factory, which it was like Ningbo or anyway. I asked him about India, and he said, those people are good at math. So like, I thought that was pretty funny. Um, so like, that was kind of what, you know, he, didn't, he really thought a lot about the United States, and, and, and his focus was all about, you know, he, he told the historical parallel, which I bounced off Scott. He said, you know, it reminds us of World War II. You know, you guys do all the fighting or of the Britain-United States relationship. In World War II, they, the Brits did all the fighting and we paid, we paid for that. And he said, that's what's happening now. And, and you know, we, we want to be where you guys are. Uh, but he wasn't too worried about India, <laughs> except for the math. He did think they were excellent at math. Mm. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about the uh, sense of hustle in the Chinese business? Oh, I think chi chi Chinese feel like they're always trying to catch up uh, for, I mean, since prior to the middle of the 19th century, uh, China was the world's largest economy, right? And then along came Britain and the uh, Industrial Revolution and the, and the rest of us. And China went through 100 plus years of, of uh, shrinking, of having civil war, chaos, being semi-colonized. Uh, and you know, since 1949, uh, regaining a lost status has been important to them. Uh, I, but I think just like any developing country, they, they want to get ahead. Uh, and they have, they see, they look uh, around the world for best practices. Um, and so they're very competitive internationally. They're also competitive domestically. Yeah. I mean, you just think about kid, there's a, uh, in order to get your, your child into the right high school or right college, the examination system is really brutal. 
and and so the the amount of pressure that children are under to to study and get ahead uh, and so it's replicated at all facets of life amongst amongst everybody so the, really the the level of energy and intensity is just just amazing you use the word uh, uh, competition yes uh, we look at this thing through the prism of uh, American business uh, which is now we're looking at the a communist society, uh, what, what do you see as the differences? How is, it, is there an apparent difference in uh, competitiveness? Uh, is it state-owned, or where, where, uh, how far is capitalism advanced in, within China? Okay. Very briefly, because I know we're, we're running up against the clock as well, uh, and this, the insights that you all have would be helpful as well. But uh, China is run by the CCP, uh, which I think of as the Chinese Capitalist Party. Uh, not the Chinese Communist Party. China is, is, has a legacy of socialism uh, that still lingers and that you can see in the way society is organized and the differences between urban and rural. Uh, but this is a country that has really embraced uh, the market and, and capitalism. Now, all the, all, there's lots of regulation and the government intervenes in just about every facet of life. Um, but um, this isn't a place where central planners sit with their pens and decide what's going to happen here or there. Um, and even if they do, that's usually not how things work out. So it's really, it, I was just, we were just talking uh, informally before the presentation. China's just a mass of contradictions, which they also uh, play. So it's a place with the world's largest number of billionaires. Uh, it's got the world's largest number of people in poverty. It's got, it's going to, it's the world's, it's already the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. It's going to be the world's largest producer of green technologies. So we just have to be willing to live with these two things on many levels on, at the same time. Okay, thank you, Scott, and thank you, panel. Uh, thank you.